Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the What's Up webcast. We do this every Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific, right here at the Skywatcher USA YouTube channel. Uh, if you've never joined us before, welcome. Happy Friday. Uh, if you've obviously been here before, thanks for coming and hanging out on your Friday morning uh, with us once again. Uh, these episodes are generally live at the time of their airing, and they are saved. So if you ever want to go back and maybe you want to review something or check something out that you missed, uh, you can always go back into our YouTube channel library. You can see all the What's Up webcast episodes uh, whenever you feel like doing that. Uh, so today we are actually talking about optical and atmospheric aberrations. Uh, this is something that comes up quite a bit in tech support, especially with newcomers and even advanced users I find um, have, this comes up a lot. Um, a lot of times the telescope can be blamed for a lot of things and not saying that it's, that's not generally true, uh, but it's not always true that the telescope has a problem with it. And knowing and understanding the different aberrations that one can see when using optical instruments will help you diagnose any issues that you might be having in your system and get those better images out of it. And that's a big thing. It's just part of being knowledgeable about all the other factors that come into uh, play when you are using a telescope. Um, I see it time after time that we'll get people calling in saying my telescope's defective. It has all these issues. Um, I want a new one or whatever. And a lot of times we'll get the telescope back. But we actually don't find an issue with it. And that's because there are other issues at play that the individual might not be knowledgeable about or know how to diagnose and see that. And the point of the what's up webcast is just that it's to kind of help share knowledge and hopefully it's helpful for someone out there to better understand what you're seeing and and how to address that and at times yeah you could have an issue with your optical system and whoever the manufacturer of that should you know look into that and take care of it but <clears throat> more often than not there's other factors going on so that's what we're going to be digging um, into today now, like I said, if you uh, like what you see here, please go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Uh, leave a like to a video. If you have any ideas for a future What's Up webcast uh, episode, we're always looking for new ideas uh, to get that, uh, any of that. Uh, what am I going on? I'm sorry, I'm tired. Um, <clears throat> as I'm sure many of us are. Uh, mainly because we all stayed up way too late doing this and this. And this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this. And I'm sure that's exactly what all of social media looks like right now is just eclipse pictures. So hopefully you got some good views last night. Uh, maybe you're a little tired like I am. But, you know, that's that's okay. That's what the hobby is about. Um, but yeah, we're going to be talking about aberrations today. But before we jump into that, we are right around uh, the holiday season is right around the corner. Uh, there's a lot of equipment right now that's on back order. So, you know, getting a telescope for Christmas or Hanukkah or whatever your belief may be or uh, holiday of choices, um, it might be difficult to get something in time for that. So uh, we've been busy. Uh, our marketing team's been busy um, updating our Threadless store. That is skywatcher.threadless.com. Um, we've got all kinds of cool stuff up there now. We've, we have had the equipment shirts that you guys have seen before, but now we have all kinds of things. So we have our uh, new shirts that have optic, you know, different objects on it. We kind of did a sports theme on it. Um, so these are available right now. Um, they've actually done some really cool stuff. You can even get shoes made up now with different images on there. So all kinds of uh, crazy stuff um, right there. Uh, they've been really cool, um, leggings, uh, all kinds of stuff. So if you're looking for something neat for the holiday season or just because you want to, uh, we have the Threadless store right there with all kinds of cool uh, new swag up there that you can see, and we've been busy with that. So uh, thanks to Jeff and Jared for knocking all of that out um, and seeing all kinds of cool stuff there. So. That is skywatcher.threadless.com. If you're looking for something neat, um, there you go. That's my plug for it. <clears throat> All right. 
So let's just dig right into it. If you have questions, I'll try to answer them through throughout the uh, event as well. And uh, we'll be, uh, I'm sorry, got too many things going on. Um, we're going to be talking about aberrations today and we're just going to jump right into it. So aberrations, what are they? So aberrations are really a defect uh, that affects the overall image or view inside your telescope. Um, I know many of us have seen it uh, and they come under a lot of different types. Um, there's all kinds of aberrations that we should be aware of at this point. Uh, this can come from optical. It can also come from mechanical. We're going to talk about a couple mechanical things, but I've thrown that under the optical side of things. Um, and then there's of course atmospheric so optical is an issue with our system um our our physical system uh something that's occurring either inside of our telescope or our imaging train um that is going to be optical and like i said i have swept uh, one or two um what would technically be mechanical topics under that but just to keep things uh easy i just put optical or atmospheric today so that's how we're going to do that um, but we could have done a third one for mechanical if we really needed to so um, optical issues like I said are um, issues that reside within the telescope or imaging train or whatever you're using to view they reside there atmospheric are issues that are basically caused by the conditions or nature we don't have a lot of control over any atmospheric uh, aberrations, but they can nonetheless still affect your view and your image. So, uh, yeah, it's um, there are there's a couple things you want to pay attention to there. <laughs> now, addressing these issues uh, will hopefully yield a, a better image for you or view depending on what you're doing because all of these aberrations are visible um, photographically or visual so it doesn't really matter what you're doing but overall the end goal is for us to get a nice image through the telescope or just a nice view and trying to remedy these aberrations will help you ultimately get there the way you want to do it um, now there is certain optical aberrations that will actually vary from design of telescope certain certain aberrations that we're going to talk about today do not occur in certain designs and we'll we'll talk about that more in detail there so um before i jump into it this isn't going to be a super techie you know in-depth optical discussion because i'm not an optician these are just general overviews of the typical things that we see basically what happens is we get questions through tech support all the time and i try to make an episode around that so it better assists the questions that come up frequently um, for the most part so that's kind of where the ideas come from so i'm going to start off with optical aberrations um, mechanical aberrations are also going to be put in here i've got one or two that are in here so just an fyi if you're looking for something like that but we're going to start with the stuff that really fundamentally involves the equipment. And uh, then we'll move into the more uh, stuff that more uh, stuff. I can't talk this morning. Um, things that are uh, done by nature with atmospheric. So uh, optical aberrations are the result of issues within the optical train your camera your filter wheel your diagonal your eyepiece or the telescope itself that is where that resides and pinning those down will help you figure out what's going on with it uh, these are the most common types of issues that come up in astronomy a lot of times uh, there are issues that come up with uh, atmospheric but that's what we're going to talk about towards the end of the presentation here so uh, this is we're just starting off with the the basic stuff that we generally get a lot of questions are uh, most of the time these are mechanical or optical idiosyncrasies in the system um, something's set up wrong maybe there is an issue with the something in the optics something like that uh, but 
where the goal is to try and pin down what the problem might be because it is generally sitting inside of our equipment and learning to know what an aberration looks like can help you better dive into how to address it in your system. Now, one thing that I find a lot of is that a lot of people will not take the time to uh, really look into issues uh, before reaching out. Uh, we are here and all these other companies are here to assist, um, but things are really busy right now. So uh, not that we, I'm not saying we don't have time to assist customers. That's what we're here for. But taking the time to understand issues that might pop up in your system and learning how to address that beforehand might get you to a resolution a lot faster. Um, and if you ultimately need help, obviously the manufacturers are here to assist at any time, but um, putting the effort ahead of time to see if you can do as much as you can to pin down the issue um, will probably get you to the end goal a lot faster just because everybody's really busy right now. So, but knowing the ins and outs of your system will be really helpful uh, with all of that. So let's talk the most basic one I think most of us are very aware of, and that is chromatic aberration. Uh, chromatic aberration is basically just out of focus light. Uh, the optical system is not focusing light equally across all the wavelengths. Now, this is usually uh, present more in the blue and the violet wavelengths. Um, and it shows up as these like blue or purplish halos. Uh, if you've ever seen, you know, a cheap pair of binoculars and you've pointed it at something bright or a cheap camera lens and you've pointed at like a rooftop or some real high contrast area, you'll see that blue or purple fringing around that. That's chromatic aberration. Um, and that's that purple fringe that we generally see. Now, this is a pretty common uh, aberration. It's probably the most common out of all of them. Um, generally because we see it in one type of telescope and that's a refractor, particularly an achromatic refractor, which are the more uh, less expensive uh, refractors on the market. So basically what's occurring is we have our refractor and most achromats are composed of two lenses in their objective to make up the, the main objective lens. That is then refracting or bending and focusing the light to a point. Now, what happens with these achromat refractors is they don't focus all the colors equally. So red, green, and blue are not focused to the equal position. Usually it's, you know, blue is a little bit more out of focus than the greens and the reds. And this is where you get that purple blue halo it's basically an out of focus image where the blue part of the image is not focused with the rest of the image. And like I said, this is most commonly found in achromatic refractors, which are going to be your less expensive uh, refractors on the market. Uh, if you're just beginning or um, if you don't have a telescope that says ED on it, um, even some lesser expensive ED refractors can show some kind of color but a lot of modern day refractors with the more expensive glass have done a very nice job at controlling this. Now, you've probably also seen on the market that there's vera there's a variety of aperture sizes. Um, you know, you can go all the way up to like the Celestron C6R. That's a great refractor for the money, but it's a six inch F8 refractor. If you're looking for a big refractor for not a lot of money. That's the best refractor you can get. It's a phenomenal telescope, but it's going to have some color on it. And that's because it's it's a big aperture and it is a longer focal length, but it's not long enough to help correct the color aberration. So the larger the objective of the refractor, the more present chromatic aberration can be because you have more light. Now to correct that, you could generally go longer focal length, like the refractor I'm talking about right now, the Celestron C6R is a F8, which is, it's a, it's a decent size tube actually, but you'd probably have to go to something like F12 to get it to where it's corrected better. 
but then it becomes this ungainly thing to haul around at that point. Um, so the faster the optics of the Acromat refractor, the more color will show up, and then the bigger the aperture. Depend. It's all. It's kind of this ratio where you're trying to mix the overall aperture size to the focal length of the telescope. Longer focal length can help correct it, but more aperture can add to it as well. So if you have something like these short tube refractors, like we have like a, our Star Travel 120 on the AZ-3. It's a 120 millimeter F5 achromatic refractor. It's really designed for wide field work. If you put one of those on the moon, you're going to have a ton of chromatic aberration because it's almost a five inch refractor. So it's got decent aperture on it, but it's real short. So it's having to focus all that light really quickly. So you're going to get a tremendous amount of color uh, aberration at that point. So those are really just made, but that's the bent, that's the trade-off that you're getting. You're getting more aperture. You're getting this big refractor, but the trade-off is you're going to have some color uh, to deal with on those bright objects. Now, uh, did I have a duplicate? I did have a duplicate side. Here's kind of how that looks. So obviously you have no aberration, nice clean stars. Um, and then you'd have chromatic aberration, particularly on brighter objects where you're going to have that blue or purple fringing. Um, so that can come up. Now, the way to get around chromatic aberration is generally a more advanced optical design like an apochromatic or an ED doublet where they have an exotic piece of glass in there. Um, usually an ED glass or a synthetic fluorite or even real fluorite. Um, if you want to pay top dollar for that, those uh, more advanced optical substrates can help address that color uh, aberration. And that's what we're paying a lot more for nowadays. And that's why APO refractors are so popular is because they are becoming more affordable to produce and they allow you to have a smaller footprint, but they're going to give you improved color correction because of the better glass inside of there. But that comes at a cost. That's why you see a hundred millimeter acromats probably three four hundred dollars maybe even has a mount with it at that price where a 100 millimeter apo or even a doublet is gonna be uh over a thousand dollars and it can be kind of deceiving when you first are getting into it where you don't understand the difference between acromat and apochromat which we have a whole episode on refractors you can go back and watch and uh, see that but that extra high-end glass that a lot of us are using now in our telescopes allow us to correct that color aberration because the majority of the market now wants to take pictures. And with astrophotography, cameras are much more sensitive to this chromatic aberration on bright objects in comparison to the human eye. So even our EvoStar doublets, which are very well corrected for what they are, some of the more sensitive cameras on the market, when you're pointing up at a bright object, can still pull color out of it, even though visually they look great. And that's kind of what those are designed for. Like our EvoStar doublets are designed to be an affordable APO refractor for visual work because the eye doesn't need to be as sensitive for that. Of course, you can still use it for imaging, but it's not going to be as good as a triplet refractor. A triplet refractor has another a third element in its objective which helps with color correction even further um, but again it becomes more expensive because you're producing more stuff um, now if you have an acromat refractor and you just want a cheap way to get around it you can get like these v-block filters or uh, they're they come in all different names but basically what they're doing is they're filtering out that purple uh, fringe um, it does shift the way the color looks in the image, but it gets rid of that purple fringing. And it's all a personal preference of how much it really bothers you. Something like the EQ or the C6R, uh, like Celestra, and I've had a couple of those. They're not too bad. And I have a lot of people who have used them and they don't find it to be um, annoying, but it, it's all personal preference when it comes to chromatic aberration. Uh, next one is spherical aberration. Uh, spherical is a little bit more difficult to, to wrangle. Um, 
this means the system is not focusing the light evenly and that's generally across the field uh, stars are going to be soft and maybe show like a symmetrical halo around them it's just they're not going to be pinpoint it's just going to look uh, blurry you'll see spots of light you'll probably even get an image but they're not going to be razor sharp um, this uh, is usually an issue with the telescope optics that uh, would likely have to be addressed by the manufacturer if you're seeing major spherical aberration that's not supposed to be there um, most telescopes obviously are corrected for spherical aberration some of the cheaper newtonians um, on the market like these really cheap tabletop dobs you want to look at the specifications on the mirrors because you'll probably find that they're spheres. Uh, that's not a big deal when it's probably a $100 telescope because that's all it is and it's really easy to make a spherical mirror. It's actually the easiest mirror to make. Um, above that would be a parabolic mirror, which corrects for that spherical aberration. That's why it's parabolic. But uh, you will notice if you ever look at a sphere... Um, or you're going to have spherical aberration in your telescope, it's going to look like everything is, is fuzzy and you can't get a super sharp image on it. kind of looks like this, um, really. So that's spherical aberration. It does come up um, now and again. This is one of the more difficult aberrations to um, discuss because there's not a lot you or myself as an owner of the telescope can really do about it. It's something that probably needs to be addressed uh, by the manufacturer and the optics itself need to be addressed in a way that an owner of a telescope can't normally do. So that's spherical aberration right there. Um, it comes up, but a lot of the telescopes on the market nowadays are very well corrected to where you don't have to deal with this, um, uh, but it does come up. <clears throat> Coma. Right after chromatic aberration, coma, I think, is one of the most common uh, aberrations that we see because it exists in one of the most popular designs. So coma, as many of us know, uh, the light is not being focused at the same uh, from the edge of the center of the image to the outer portion of the image. Um, and this gives us stars that look like little comets or flared tails at the end there. Um, this is a uh, quite common in fast aperture uh, lenses. You know, if you're shooting nightscapes and you've got those really fast, you know, like a 14 f 2.8 or something like that. Um, those lenses, while nice, and are not well corrected at the edge. They're going to show some kind of coma um, towards the edge. It's also very common in parabolic mirrors that we find in Newtonians and Dobsonians and uh, particularly fast optical systems like we're starting to see uh, in the modern day. So I didn't want to zoom in too much on this image because there was some trailing. I wasn't using a tracker, so it wasn't a great example. But towards the edge, especially up in the corners here, you'll notice that all the stars are just a mess. They have this little comet or these wings or seagull looking uh, wings to them up here at the corner. That's coma. Um, they're just not pinpoint stars. And it's kind of got that telltale sign of coma because they have like the, the wings to them. And no matter what you do, you're not gonna be able to get that uh, corrected, uh, leaving the lens wide open. Uh, now, there are a couple ways that you can address uh, coma, but it obviously depends on what we're actually talking about there. So for fast Newtonians, uh, and when I mean fast, I'm talking about stuff like this. Um, these are kind of on the extreme side of things. But um, if you've ever looked at a lot of the modern day custom built dobs, a lot of dobs now are sub F4 uh focal lengths it's very very fast that's to keep them compact and to keep them short and opticians have gotten very good nowadays at making optics this fast um, it's also you know comes up in our product line with the quattros now i find coma after talking to people i find coma is very similar to chromatic aberration and it's kind of a personal um how much are you willing to put up with it 
some of the higher end eyepieces like the televues and stuff like that do well at kind of mitigating it in I would say F4 optics but ultimately um, I find that F4.5 so if you have a Newtonian or a Dobsonian find F4.5 is pretty acceptable but once you go below F4.5 focal lengths things get a little bit more severe especially as you push down to F4 and especially as you go below F4 with a lot of these modern day high-end dobs, it's uh, coma becomes a big issue because you're a lot of the more the steeper that curve is going to get on that mirror, the harder that coma is going to show up and the more of your field is going to be out of focus and not pinpoint and sharp. Now, there's easy ways off the shelf to deal with coma in a modern day uh, Newtonian, you know, a, a good coma corrector. This is the Teleview Paracore 2. Let's see if I can get this focused a little bit better. Shouldn't have messed with it. Uh, there we go. Uh, so, you know, Teleview Paracore 2 is a real good uh, coma corrector uh, for many modern day teles uh, Dobsonians because unlike the original Paracore, this one can actually go down to even sub F3 um, and correct um, a lot of that. Uh, um, I'm sorry, too many different things going in my head. Uh, can do very well at correcting coma. And then if you want to use it for imaging, you can actually get this and it threads off. So you just take the glass piece of the coma corrector um, and this, uh, you could use this for imaging with the right adapters. So, uh, but the Paracore 2 does a very nice job with a lot of modern day uh, telescopes. Uh, we use these on our old 18 and 20 inch dobs that we used to sell and it did a very nice job. Those were F4. It does a very nice job on if you're trying to use our Quattro uh, Newtonians visually. The Paracore 2 does a very nice job uh, visually for that. There's some other ones on the market as well. Botter has one. Explore Scientific has one. Uh, those are designed for both imaging and visual. We have one for our Quattros that's specifically for imaging. So uh, there's that as well. But that's the trade-off that you're getting. You're getting these more compact, real small setups, um, big aperture stuff, smaller ladder, shorter the ground. And you just need to have a corrector, like a coma corrector to take care of that. So, But that's how you would do that. Now, if you have one of these fast like wide angle lenses you're doing a lot of nightscape work and you're getting flaring at the edges of your uh, lens with the coma that's going on in there you're gonna have to stop down the aperture of that lens I am um, you know that's kind of the thing a lot of these lenses that are made by these camera companies are not really designed to handle um, star fields well star fields are very difficult on a lens and to have a lens that's f 1.4 or f2 or f 2.8 that's corrected all the way out to the edge of the field would be impressive but normally you're gonna have to stop down the aperture a bit so that's why if if you're gonna do nightscape work and you don't want to deal with coma try to get a prime lens something that's uh oh sorry get my camera back on here likes to shut off on me now and again plus i need to show you this slide anyway um you want to get these fast lenses if you have a lens that's f 1.4 f 1.2 something really fast the nice thing about that is you can always stop that down to f 2.8 and it's going to look a lot better now if you've got an f 2.8 lens then you have to stop down to like f 4 so you're losing even more light so if you're doing nightscape photography and coma is an issue i'd recommend getting the fastest lens you can get because it's already going to be brighter than a zoom lens is going to be and then stopping that down because then you're still going to be at a whopping f 2.8 uh but you're not going to have the coma there because you have the ability to stop down further do that wide aperture but coma is really easy to address on a lot of the modern day telescopes if you have a dobsonian i i personally from my experience wouldn't worry about buying a, a coma corrector for your dobsonian unless you're under f 4.5 or it really just bugs you um on our 16 inch uh and 14 inch dobsonians that we sell those are 4.5 and 4.6 
I can see coma in them, but it's not a $500 to $600 problem because that's how much a good coma corrector costs roughly. I don't know the price on all of them, but you kind of have to ask yourself ultimately, is this issue worth this much to correct? And for a lot of the daubs that are on the market right now from, you know, 8 inch to 12, 8 inch to 16 inch that are mass produced, a lot of them are F4.5 at the fastest. I don't think you need to spend money on a coma corrector at that point, but if it bugs you, you can always add it. Now, if you're going to go faster than that, if you're going to hit F4, I personally would recommend getting a coma corrector at that point. And then if you're going with something that's uh, under F4, uh, you're going to need a coma corrector regardless, in my personal opinion, because coma is going to just get all over the field and be kind of obnoxious uh, there. But at that point, if you're spending money on a sub F4 primary, you're already making a significant investment. So the investment of a coma corrector is very small in the grand scheme of that entire system. You know what you're getting yourself into at that point. So that's coma, very easy to address. Now, next one is astigmatism. And astigmatism is kind of an interesting one. It's one of those that you can't do a lot about. Um, again, it's kind of an optical issue. Uh, Light across the field will not focus to a point. Um, it's generally forming two focal points. The stars actually look like lines or diamonds, if you will. Um, so it it's going to look weird. You'll never be able to get a pinpoint star point on this. So um, they're always going to appear like lines. This is also the most difficult aberration to address. Uh, because if you're seeing it, it generally means that there's something going on with the optics. They might be pinched, the cell's too tight, um, maybe there is some kind of issue with the optical assembly, but a lot of times that's something that probably should be addressed by the manufacturer of the optics or with someone who knows how to adjust that particular um, telescope uh, correctly at that point. Now, we've had this happen before. You can have astigmatism in your eye. I've had several people call in and send telescopes to us to get service because they're seeing astigmatism. Just for us to get it back and find out, we put it on an artificial star and we star test it just to find out that there isn't any astigmatism um, and that it was actually their eye. I've had two or three customers who weren't aware that they had astigmatism at the time, and now they do. Um, now, if, you, if you're not sure if the astigmatism is you or the telescope, uh, the best way to do it is actually rotate your, uh, your head while you're observing through the telescope. And if the astigmatism is in your eye, you'll notice that the star flare pattern, the line-looking the lines in the astigmatism image will rotate as you rotate your eye. So that's something that if you're unsure, um, that's something that you'd want to pay attention to if you're not sure if the astigmatism is in the telescope or you. Um, another thing to pinpoint astigmatism in your eye is it's going to be more visible at lower powers where generally astigmatism in a telescope would be more visible at higher powers. So if you're seeing astigmatism at low power, there's a there's a half chance that it's probably you, and maybe you need to get that checked out um, with your um, eye doctor at that point and see. Now there are Teleview does make some cool um, accessories to help with astigmatism as well. So um, there are ways to get around that, um, but it's something that you'd probably want to get checked out by your eye doctor if you found that you actually had astigmatism in your eye um but uh if it's in the telescope you can actually tell because a it's not going to rotate when you move your head and you can actually try focusing the telescope in and out of focus and when you do that the lines are going to go from one position and they're going to flip by 90 degrees and that's how you can actually tell there's astigmatism with the telescope because as you come into focus, 
you're going to go in fo you're out of focus then you come into focus where you should get a perfect star image and then go out again you're going to watch that and i'll do this again um, you're going to watch those lines shift as you go in and out of focus and they will flip 90 degrees and that's a, a telltale sign that there's an issue with the optical system either something's getting pinched or the cell isn't doing it right uh, holding the optics right um, we've actually had some people call in saying like for this uh, on the mac cassegrains for instance um, and i've also seen this on some of the solar filters out there that you'll sometimes if you were to actually shake the telescope you might hear a little bit of a shift in some of the optics that are in there and you'll get people saying oh my gosh it's loose and there's an issue with my telescope some designs need to have a small amount of movement to make sure that the optics that the, the cell is holding are not being pinched because if it's if it's locked too far down in there you could cause the optics to warp which then might show you astigmatism where you're pinching it it also can happen if you have a newtonian or a dobsonian that has mirror clips in the mirror cell like a lot of our dobs do and let's say you're messing around with the clips and you tighten them down and wrench them down it will warp the surface of the mirror and it's going to give you really funky star images that's because the mirror or the lens is being stressed too much by the cell so there's a balance between how much is there to keep the mirror in place versus you know actually hurting your images there so you want to be careful especially if you're working on like our Newtonians and stuff like that. I've done this a long time ago when I was getting started where I thought the clips had to be wrenched down to keep my mirror from going anywhere. There's a happy medium there. They should be just to where they touch the mirror. That's it. Don't wrench them any further than that because the tighter you wrench those clips down, the more stress it puts on squeezing the mirror and causing it to warp. And then you're going to get really funky images that'll probably lead to astigmatism. And then the way to address that is to loosen them a little bit. So you reduce that strain. So um, that's astigmatism. It's the most difficult one to deal with because you have to pin down where the actual issue is. Another one that comes up a lot, and this is a mechanical issue, is tilt. Uh, tilt is extremely common in astrophotography because we're putting a ton of crap on the back of our telescope. Um, now this, um, it's not a true optical issue. It's actually a mechanical issue, but I didn't want to get too far into the weeds here. So this is caused by something in the optical path, not being flush or parallel to keeping everything uniform and straight. This is where a portion of the image, um, is in focus and then another portion is you'll start to see the stars blur, especially as it transitions across the screen uh, or the image there. Mainly an imaging issue, especially because we're putting cameras with flat sensors, um, filters, flatteners, OAGs. You're stacking a lot of stuff on the back of your telescope, which can cause things to bend. Um, so that can be uh, an issue and show up as tilt. Now, there are different ways to measure tilt. Um, usually you can see tilt when it's really severe. You'll notice part of your image is in focus and part of your image isn't. Um, you can also use like, uh, different programs. Uh, this is, uh, uh, this is from CCD soft. Um, I forgot the name of the actual program, but this is how we measure tilt because it shows you a nice, uh, 3d graphic of how the image is actually tilted. And you can see this particular sample, the image is tilted right there. Um, and we can see the error in there. Now, the way to deal with tilt is it generally has to do with collimation. And it might not be the collimation so much of the optical system, but you can also collimate your, your imaging train. Uh, companies like ZWO, uh, QHY, Starlight Express, um, a lot of the major companies nowadays um, have tilt plates on their cameras to help level that out because that gives you a, the ability to help correct what is generally tilt being seen by the, the camera sensor 
is somehow tilted. Either the sensor itself is tilted, which is common in uh, less expensive cameras, um, or there's a tilt somewhere in the imaging train before the camera, and you can help eat up some of that tilt by having an, a, a tilt plate on the camera there. So a lot of modern day cameras have a collimatable plate to where you could make some adjustments uh, to help make that uh, camera sensor more parallel to the, the light path uh, so you don't have any uh, weird artifacts in your stars uh, at the when you're out imaging. Now, there's a couple ways that help address tilt, especially be, tilt can be uh, difficult to pin down because you need to see where it's present at. Um, you want to first, if you're, if you're starting to notice that there's issues there, the first thing to do is to take your camera and rotate it. Now, if the issue rotates with the camera, that means your camera sensor has tilt. And like I said, that can be common in some of these more uh, budget-friendly cameras. They're just not assembled as tight. So there's that. Uh, and then lastly, if it doesn't rotate, it means the issue is probably forward of the camera sensor, either in your imaging train or maybe your focuser is tilted um, at that point. So that's something to keep an eye out on as well. Okay, uh, atmospheric aberrations. There's not many of them that really affect us uh, too much, but there's just a couple that I wanted to cover real quick. Um, uh, atmospheric aberrations are basically caused by nature. Uh, local conditions will always be a factor when you're observing. Uh, good conditions and allowing your optics to adapt will produce the best images. So when you go outside, don't just throw your telescope out there, put a six millimeter eyepiece in it and chuck it out a star and expect to get this perfect razor sharp image. Your seeing conditions are going to be the major dictator of how sharp your images are going to be for the evening. You're going to have to deal with that from night to night. We have a whole episode talking about seeing conditions if you want to go back and take a look at that. But nature is going to be the big factor of how you deal with that. Now, one of the biggest ones, and really the only one that I could dig up for this, uh, is atmospheric dispersion. Um, this is caused by light being bent in the atmosphere. It's like a prism, like the Pink Floyd album. Uh, this causes the light to basically break apart in color as it passes through the atmosphere and gets to us. Um, most of the time, you'll see a reddish hue followed by your object and then a blue hue. It looks, it almost looks like chromatic aberration, but there's a red and blue hue. That's a very telltale mark of atmospheric dispersion. This is usually seen when objects are fairly low in the sky. Um, so keep an eye on that when you're imaging. Um, for example here, just to show you, you've got Jupiter. Here's our observer, Earth, and the atmosphere incoming light from Jupiter or whatever you're looking at is going to hit the atmosphere and then it's going to break apart. And then it shows you some, you know, interesting stuff like this. You know, if you zoom in, you'll notice that you're, it's kind of like the light is smeared out in a spectrum. That's atmospheric dispersion. Now you can actually address this. Um, it's very common in planetary imaging because you're magnifying it so much. So that's most of the time where you see it. You can see it in deep sky images in your stars if you're shooting really low, um, an object that's too low, maybe let it rise a little bit higher. But um, you can ad you can add an atmospheric dispersion corrector if you're really into planetary imaging. That uses two prisms, two parallel prisms that you rotate to help counterbalance um, uh, the diffraction there or that dispersion. So there's that if you're looking to do something like that. Um, but it's most commonly found in planetary imaging. So Something to check out if, if planetary is your thing and you want to deal with that. You wouldn't really see it too much if you're doing monochrome cameras because you're going to be refocusing and only isolating that certain wavelength when you're shooting red, green, and blue. But if you're shooting a color camera and you're getting all of the image at once, you're going to notice it more often. So a monochrome camera with a, pair of, with a set of filters in there isn't going to be so much susceptible to this because you're already only isolating that particular uh, color, where if you're using a one-shot color, maybe having that um, 
atmospheric dispersion corrector would be something to look at. So that's a way to deal with that. Lastly, local conditions. This is a big one. I see it come up all the time. Uh, seeing conditions are going to vary from region to region. You could go out and be like, wow, the conditions are great tonight. But that's your overall seeing. Uh, you can have great seeing, but your local conditions can be affected differently um, compared to the general seeing. So if you go to like clear sky clocks or something like that, and it says, oh, tonight's a five out of five, and you go outside and it's like, wow, this is crap. Um, there could be something locally occurring. Um, you know, maybe your neighbors have an AC on or there's a fire going on and there's heat going in front of it, or maybe you're viewing over a rooftop after a hot day and it's cooling off or you're on a road. Those are local seeing conditions that will affect the overall view that you're seeing inside of your telescope there. Um, so you can have great conditions overall, but if you don't have uh, conditions and stuff like that locally that are gonna support that, it, it doesn't really matter. So anyway, that's, pretty much it i know we've got some uh, questions there uh like i said earlier if you like what you see here please go ahead and subscribe leave a like to a video we definitely appreciate it lets us know we're doing a good job um now uh next week is uh black friday and thanksgiving uh skywatcher will be closed wins i'm sorry thursday and friday in honor of the th and of course saturday and sunday um we will not be open However, we will have a webcast next week at our same time. It is a pre-recorded webcast because we're sitting down with Dylan O'Donnell uh, from Star Stuff on YouTube. And it kind of worked out because of the major time change between us and him down in Australia. Uh, we had to pre-record it anyway. So that is going to air 10 a.m. Pacific next Friday. So if you want to be there for that. Uh, we'll be sitting down talking to Dylan. It's an interesting episode just because we kind of go back and forth talking to each other on a bunch of different topics. Um, but it was a lot of fun to sit down with him and uh, talk shop with uh, Dylan there. So that is next week's episode. Um, so feel free to join us here then. It is a pre-recorded episode, so I will not be here live. Um, but I may be floating around watching that episode uh, when it airs. So uh, again, thanks for joining us. Uh, and let's just dig into the questions that we've got here. First one, uh, future episode idea, star testing for mere mortals. We could do that one. There's a couple interesting tricks I've learned over the years on how you can actually do star testing, um, even at not at night. Uh, and it's kind of helpful if you're in the field. Um, we'll try to do that one. I will mention any ideas for future webcast episodes. We do these, we, uh, we schedule these per quarter. So just because you threw an idea out there and you don't see it like next month doesn't mean we've ignored it. It means it's probably being considered, but you probably won't see it for a few weeks to months later uh, to where we see where it balances out in the queue. So uh, just because you don't see it doesn't mean we're not doing it. Uh, so just a heads up there uh any new products in the pipeline yes but i can't tell you about them yet you'll just have to wait till next year uh we're gonna do episodes on it we're already talking about it uh we've got a couple big things planned some stuff that you guys are really like and yeah but we have at least a half a dozen products that will probably be hopefully announced in the next uh 12 months so keep an eye on it it is a range of different things it's not just one type of product or another but we have a lot of cool stuff coming. We will do episodes on those products when they are ready to be announced. So hang in there. Um, we're excited to show you when we can actually talk about them. Uh, I have a Esprit 150 Super Apo triplet. has some funny looking stars. Uh, do you need a doctor or Jesus or technical team? Uh, buying a $5,000 triplet more expensive than I test. Um, if you're having issues with an Esprit 150, I would talk to whoever you bought it from. It's very, very rare uh, for the Esprits to have optical issues because they go through a tremendous amount of testing before they ship. Um, not to say things don't happen, 
but you pro if you are seeing something, you probably want to talk to your technical team um, from whoever you bought it from, your local distributor, to see if they can help you pin down what's going on with it because the Esprits go through a tremendous amount of testing before they actually leave. So uh, uh, take a look at that with your local distributor and see if they can help you out. <clears throat> uh, two meter segmented mirror. Yeah, it'd be really cool to have a two meter telescope. Um, that'd be huge. 80 inch telescope. Uh, but yeah, I don't see any more questions out there. Uh, oh, here's one. Black Friday stock question. Do you have an ETA for the 14 inch sin scan? Probably well into next year at this point. Um, if you're looking for stuff right now, you're not going to get it unless you can score something last minute. You're not going to get something for the holidays. I will just be straight up with you right now. Unless you are lucky and you find a distributor that's got what you're looking for, jump on it. Do not wait. Don't think about it. And I'm not just sell telling you that to, uh, sell you something. That's just the way of the world right now. Um, or you're going to be waiting for a few months. So yeah, but right now, if you're just looking for something, if you're waiting for something to just be there on the shelf, it's not, there's nothing that's going to be sitting on a shelf anytime soon. You just have to place an order and wait. That's how it's going. Uh, lastly, one more time, uh, we've got a bunch of cool stir, uh, cool stuff. Got a bunch of swag up here. Uh, that is our skywatcher.threadless.com, uh, swag store shirts shoes leggings all kinds of cool stuff um, if you've got cool images send them to us and uh maybe we can make it into a shirt or something cool like that wouldn't that be neat so again that is skywatcher.threadless.com um bunch of cool stuff there and it's ready to go whenever just place the order and it'll ship in a couple days so uh other than that that is it for this week uh thank you very much for joining us um hopefully this was helpful uh, for those of you who are watching or those of you in the future who are watching, hopefully this was a helpful episode and kind of pinning down what's going on with your telescope. Um, we'll see you next Friday talking to Dylan O'Donnell. Um, have a safe Thanksgiving if you're here in the U.S. Uh, have a safe uh, turkey day. Um, don't beat anybody up on Friday over a TV or anything weird like that. Um, and then we'll see you here Friday morning, 10 a.m. Pacific to sit down as we talk to Dylan. Uh, so have a safe weekend. Have a safe holiday. And we'll see you guys uh, in a couple weeks. Uh, thanks a lot. Take care, everyone. Bye.